Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daryl. I come from uh, Melbourne. Melbourne is the best city in the world. Oh, no one agrees with me. I said that this morning, but no, you need to come and visit, and then you'll realize why it's the best. There, we have less stressed people in Melbourne than in Sydney, I can guarantee you. How do I know that? People in Melbourne drive a lot safer than people in Sydney. So I know they're less stressed. No, I'm just kidding. And so this afternoon, I have the privilege of sharing. Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit about stress and how not to get stressed. Some of you may already be familiar with what I'm about to share, but perhaps this casts a very different angle and a very different perspective on what it is. You see, I'm a young professional. I work as a medical doctor in the area of pediatrics in Melbourne at a children's hospital, and I look after children anywhere between the age of zero and 18. So if you're 18, you're still considered a kid. And I'm finding that more and more young children actually get stressed, whether it's from studies or from uh, their, some issues at school or maybe troubles in their life. We seem to be getting younger and younger stressed patients on a regular basis in the place that I work. And that's concerning for me because it used to be that only adults or maybe students or older people who are working or maybe people who have kids who are running around and young families get stressed. But this afternoon, I'm going to share a little bit of a very interesting topic called circusceptin and, uh, and rhythms and body rhythms to show you a little bit from science and also from the Bible about how not to get stressed. In fact, one, I'm going to skip to this picture here. Can you guys see this picture? How many of you have seen it before? Okay, anyone know the title of this uh, painting? Melting clocks, not quite. So you got the artist right. It's actually the persistence of memory. Melting clocks is the colloquial name that we use to describe the clocks that you can see here. And in this painting, it's widely thought that the painter was trying to illustrate how time is flexible and how time is, the concept of time is fluid. And I wish that the concept of time was fluid. Don't you? How many of you wish the concept of time was fluid? You know, in an exam, when you have one and a half hours, I wish that time is flexible until I finish the exam, and then the exam finishes. And so here, the, the artist was making a comment on how he felt that memory and time wasn't f indeed concrete, but he wanted it to be more fluid. The Bible gives us a different perspective because in my exams that I take as a university student or in the deadlines that you have working, you will definitely have to work to a structured time. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, everything to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So here's a little bit of comment about the time periods that we have in our everyday life. One day is defined by the rotation of Earth on its axis. If you don't have a clock which tells you today is the 29th of April and tomorrow is the 30th, you can rely on the rotation of the Earth on its axis and you can tell a day by the sunrise and the sunset. The Bible defines this structured time period, Genesis 1 verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, there are other two time periods that I put up here, a month and a year. You know that a month is the orbit of the moon around the year, and a year is the orbit, oh, sorry, a moon around the earth, and a year is the orbit of the earth around the sun. But today, the question I want to ask you is, how do we actually define the one missing time period on the screen, and that is the week? How many days in a week? Seven. Seven. How do we define in science the concept of a week? We can define the concept of a day. We can define the concept of a month. We can define the concept of a year. But how do you define the concept of a week? Anyone have any ideas? You can't. You can't. There is no rotation of any planet around any other being or planet to define a week. And the next question I want to ask is, how do you know that a week must be seven days? Can it be six? Can, can it be ten? Or five? I want a week that has three days. Holiday day one, work day two, holiday day three. Wouldn't that be a cool week? Two days of rest and one day of week per week block. 
How do we define a week? Is it simply someone coming up with an idea once upon a time that it should be five days that we work and two days of rest? Or in some places of the world, they work six days and have one day of rest. In some places of the world, they work four days and have three days. But wherever you go in the world today, whatever uh, calendar that you look at on your phone or the computer, it is a seven-day period. So seven days creation, and we're going to look at a little bit more. But it's useful to have seven days. Well, in terms of um, in terms of the longevity of a person's life um, and how we create increments, um, why not seven days? Why not ten days? Why not twenty days? So, for the purpose of, um, I guess, for the purpose of relativity, um, that's that's how we. That's how we've always done it. So it's an arbitrary number. Fair enough. I, Good points. Yeah, that's, that's just my... Good points. Because we'll come back to exactly this question at the end. The question I remember, we started off this seminar by saying, how do we not get stressed? And the, period, the reason I'm bringing up time is, stress often has a relationship with time. We get stressed because the deadline is coming up. We get stressed because there's a short period of time that we have to work in. We get stressed because things don't happen as we hope they would happen in a set period of time. And so when we look at the concept of time, there is a need to understand how we function on an everyday month, year, and indeed a week basis. Someone brought up before that there is a creation story in the Bible, which many different religions actually believe in. The Jews also believe the same creation story. It says, In seven days, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So in Judeo-Christian society or in the culture, you have a seven-day period which has been passed down from generation to generation. And indeed, much of the Western world today, in fact, all the world, we believe mostly in a seven-day and function in a seven-day week in society. So my question is, why is it seven? Besides the Bible, is there any other evidence or is there any other reason? And if I'm not a Christian or if I'm not a person who believes in Judaism or Christianity, then do I actually have a reason to follow the seven-day week? Should I not just make up a different calendar which has five days or six or 20 and make the rest of the world follow? I'm skeptical. Should we actually follow this concept which seems to have its origins not in science, but in history and culture. Some people thought along the same lines. Napoleon, in 1789, in the French Revolution, did not want a seven-day week because he felt it was too closely associated with religion. And so he adopted a French Republican calendar, 12 months, 30 days, and there is a concept of a 10-day week. Workers stayed on the job for nine days, and rested on the 10th. How many of you would enjoy that? You work for nine days and then have one day off. Anyone? No, no one wants that? Okay. So after 13 years, they found that the productivity decreased, so the calendar was discontinued. And then on, after that, they tried a five-day week. They called it the quintity. In other words, you, you work for four, rest for one, work for four, rest for one, but it too was rejected. 140 years later, Stalin in Russia decided that he would improve the productivity of his population and the factories that were in this particular part of the world by dividing the population into five groups. Each group would work a five-day week with one-day rest. So everyone would be working 
20% of the group would have rest on one day, uh, day one. 20% of the group would have rest on day two, three, four, and five. And so there was a continuous process where everyone was working, or uh, there was at least 80% of the population working on every given day. Does that make sense? That's an interesting way to improve your, your productivity, right? Make everyone work, or 80% of the population work at the same time to make sure the factories produce what they are producing. After 11 years, Stalin returned the nation to a seven-day week. In France, in 2007, there was an interesting phenomenon. There was an education minister who decided to change, or rather adapt, the school week. And the school week was initially usually about four and a half to five days, sometimes six. But they decided to change the cycle of a school week to a four-day school week. Monday and Tuesday, they would go to school. Wednesday would be off. And then Thursday and Friday, they would go to school and then have Saturday and Sunday off. Sounds like a good thing, right? For those of you who are school students or university students, four-day school week sounds better than a five-day school week. Maybe for the teachers, it's better. They get an extra day of holiday away from the crazy kids. But they found that their productivity, the school test results, the function and the alertness and the concentration of the kids was worse on a four-day broken cycle than it was on the usual five days of school, two days of rest, a seven-day cycle that they would go through. And so in 2010, they changed it back to a four-and-a-half to five-day week. So there are people in history who have decided to change. Okay, seven's an arbitrary number. Or maybe it's just something that's been passed down in history. Let's change it to 10, to 5, to 3, to whatever you want, but they found each time that somehow there is something associated with this number seven. There's no definition in science that says a week has to be seven days, but for whatever reason, they have found that productivity, function, and human interaction seems to work better. And so we begin to dig into this concept called circa septum. Circa meaning time, septum meaning about seven days. And you look at different things here. I'm giving you some um, examples. The survival and the growth of seaweed have a seven-day cycle. The activity levels of beetles have a seven-day cycle. The survival of this fly, whatever you call it, for those, maybe someone's doing a PhD on this fly here, you can pronounce it better than me. The tolerance of radiation to mice, the urinary sodium excretion, things uh, regarding medication, all have seven-day innate cycles in various unique plant and animal species. Not three, not five, not 10, not 20, but seven-day cycles which have no seemingly effect. I mean, why does the urinary sodium excretion of a mouse follow a seven-day cycle? Does it make any difference? Why doesn't it go three or five? And so this concept, Franz Halberg, who's one of the popular researchers in this area, proposes that body rhythms of about seven days far from being passively driven by the social cycle. In other words, it's not just handed down by people because they thought seven-day weeks are nice, but indeed are innate, autonomous, perhaps the reason why the calendar week arose in the first place. And so as we continue our journey, we start to see that if there is something related in our bodies to the concept of a seven-day cycle, then perhaps it pay, begs the question, should we pay more attention to a seven-day cycle as to how it regulates the stress levels in our life? In human, the human body, besides seaweed and mice and beetles, there are various cycles. The first one, we call it a circadian cycle. Do you know that there is a sleep-wake cycle? Anyone have a sleep-wake cycle here? I know all about sleep-wake cycles. You know why? I have to work night shift. And when I work night shift, my sleep-wake cycle turns upside down. Any of you traveled on and had jet lag before? Anyone had jet lag before? You know, you go to some other side of the world. When it's 12 a.m., you are wide awake. When it's 12 p.m. at noontime, you are fast asleep because your sleep-wake cycle is upside down. How is our sleep-wake cycle governed? By a hormone named melatonin and also cortisol, but mainly affected, melatonin is only produced when you, when you are in a dark area or dark place. And so your sleep-wake cycle is about a 24-hour cycle, your temperature, your blood pressure. 
For those of you who are female in the room, you will know that you have a cycle that happens approximately every month. For those of us who are male or female in the room, we know that there's a concept in medicine called circle annual. Every year, there is an increase in depression in what months? Anyone know? In winter. They call it euthymic or uh, <coughs> thymic depression because it's related to the cold weather when everyone feels like staying inside and it's dark outside. You know when you go to work in winter, it's dark when you leave the house? dark when you get home. You sometimes don't even see the sun, right? You get to work, it's still dark. And then the sun is up when you, are, when you are inside working. And then as soon as you leave the office, it's already dark. So the question is, in animals and plants, there is a seven-day cycle, a weekly cycle, a circus septum cycle. Is there the same cycle in humans? Because if there is, then we need to pay better attention to that cycle because if we pay better attention to that cycle, it's going to affect the way we deal with our routine and the affect the way we deal with stress. Circadian cycles here in this article, and if you're interested, this article was only published this year, very recent updates. If you're interested, you can take a picture, go back and look for this article on the internet and read about it. And I've quoted verbatim here because I want to demonstrate what questions we are dealing with. This article was written by four atheist French scientists. Their question was, circadian and circa monthly or circa um, tringinian, I think it's pronounced, and circa annual rhythms are genetically based features of life forms and they believe that they happen during evolution. Uh, I don't believe that, but that's, a, that's not the question we're talking about today. No such advantages are apparent for endogenous circuit or seven-day rhythms, raising several questions. Question number one, what is the significance of a seven-day cycle? Question number two, why do humans seem to require one day off per seven-day span? I'm going to talk about this. Number three, do seven-day rhythms, circa septum rhythms, bestow functional advantage to organisms, plants, animals, humans, and is the magic ascribed to the number seven of relevance? Atheist scientists asking whether or not a seven-day cycle brings any benefit to human life. And not only that, they say, why do humans, in all the research that has been done in this area over the last 65 years, seem to require one day off per seven days? Why do seven-day rhythms benefit? Do they benefit and give functional advantage to organisms? And why is it seven, not six, not ten? Aren't these the questions we just asked? When you look at the human body, there are interesting observations. Your blood pressure variations during pregnancy, if anyone is pregnant in the room, have a seven-day cycle. The blood pressure in neonates, small babies, which I deal with on a daily basis, also have a seven-day cycle. Their resting heart rate, their body weight gain, the urine chemistry, the inflammatory responses in your body, all these things which you don't seem to pay significant attention to, all have seven-day cycles. Did you know that the cognitive function, the learning, the brain development and perception in school-aged children and adolescents have both a daily and a weekly cycle? Did you know that? So let me put it to you this way. If you want to optimize your child or a child's learning and development and to reduce the stress that they face, and to improve their performance in school, you would pay attention to what their body does in and of itself on a daily and weekly cycle. Does that make sense? Do you know that scientists are starting to find that most adolescents, teenagers, when do they study and function the best? <coughs> During the day. Anyone know? Early in the morning. Early in the morning. OK, someone, anyone else want to have a different idea? Midday. Midday? They, in fact, find that adolescents, as their brain develops, start to function slightly better in the afternoon. And so you wonder why we drag adolescents up at all, all hours of the morning at 8 a.m. to go to school, because their functioning capacity is actually better in the afternoon. So do you understand what I'm trying to say here? If there is an innate cycle, both a daily and a weekly cycle, in humans, in kids and adolescents, when you teach them, when you design a school curriculum, when you design the way they function, shouldn't you design it according to what their body has, the function, that, the rhythms that are naturally in there? 
Interesting, this is another example. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible says this, and that it is eight days old, so the baby is eight days old, this is a male baby, be circumcised among you every man child in your generation, so on and so forth. The Bible recommends that on day eight of life, day one is the first day of life, they don't count day zero, right? So in other words, when the baby is actually seven 24-hour periods old, you should circumcise them. Do you know why? Because science... 200, or actually not 200, 2,000 years later, started to realize that the clotting of the baby's, um, uh, the clotting levels in the baby's body tend to be the highest on day seven. And they proved this in modern day science by, because they have prothrombin and vitamin K. If you've just had a baby, or if you know someone who had a baby, we give them vitamin K injections in Australia because the vitamin K is really low at the first day of life. And so they had significant risk of bleeding and that's why we give it to them. But we know that in those days when you don't have a vitamin K injection, the level will be highest on what day? Day seven of life because day eight is recounted as day one. So on day seven of life of the baby, we do what? Surgery. Interesting, right? So why does it have a seven-day cycle? And if you count seven days and then 14 days and 21 days, you'll find the same thing thereafter. Here's an interesting article which I want to bring to you. This is the article done on the circadian infraradian rhythms in the persistent vegetative state. So let me explain this in layman's language. These are people in ICU who are unconscious. They're in a coma. Okay? And so in this setting, they're doing interesting research on these people they find that these people who have no interaction with humans, you know, when you talk to someone in a coma, they don't respond to you, right? Even when they're in a coma, their blood pressure and heart rate rhythms have a seven-day cycle. So even without human interaction, with no concept of the time, when you're in a coma, no one cares whether it's seven-day week or 10-day week, what day is the weekend, right? You don't have a person whose heart rate goes up because it's Saturday and there's no work or whose enjoyment levels go up on the weekend because they're in a coma. And when they're in a coma, they still have a seven-day cycle. In fact, scientists, when they isolate people away from social interaction, still find that circa septum, the seven-day rhythms don't change. The daily rhythms change. The 24-hour cycles change when you isolate someone, but the weekly cycles don't. They did this interesting experiment, which I don't think nowadays they can do, but they did it on human twins, isolated in Antarctica. Pretty cool, hey? They compared the human twins and uh, pulsations in Antarctica, and they found, here, look here, often viewed as reflecting no more than the seven-day societal schedule, ample evidence for a built-in feature notwithstanding. So they're talking about the same question we're wrestling with. Is this seven-day concept something that is found only because someone has passed it down in history, or is it found actually in science? And they started to realize here that circumceptance in Antarctica, away from societal influence, was amplified, and on top of that, was more common, heart rate, blood pressure, body weight, is more similar between twins, same gender twins, than among twin pairs, leading additional support for the endogenicity of circumcision. Let me explain this to you. When they looked at twins that are separated from social, in social isolation and compared it to people that live in Antarctica, they find that things like heart rate, blood pressure, and body weight continue to follow a seven-day cycle. And on top of that, it was more common in same-gender twins who are clo more genetically closely related than among twin pairs, leading the scientists to think that seven-day cycles are automatically endo endogenous or the endogenicity of circumceptance is present in humans. In other words, what they're trying to say is, we are trying to debate whether seven-day cycles are there because someone has passed it down or seven-day cycles are there because they exist in humans whether you pass it down or not. So even if you try to change it, it will still not work because the body is programmed to function on seven days. And the conclusion was, it's endogenous. Some external factors. More and more research is starting to come out. You know your kidney, heart, and pancreas transplant 
rejection rates happen on a seven-day cycle. Your fever patterns in scarlet fever, something I see occasionally in my patients. Inflammation following jaw surgery. If you look at whole, this whole range of different types of illnesses, infections, gastrointestinal, lungs, suicide rates, hemostatic, neurological, cardiac, since there is a seven-day cycle in each of the occurrence of some of these diseases. So we've gone from why is it seven to actually, it is seven, but why, where does the seven come from? Is it just history or is it endogenous? Do you know that if you are going to have any of these cardiac-related diseases, you are most likely to, likely to have it on Monday? Anyone heard this before? You might have read some newspaper articles about this. If you're going to get a heart attack, the day you're going to get a heart attack in terms of probability, the most likely is Monday because there is a cycle. In any of these diseases related to the heart, you are most likely to get it on Monday and least likely to get it when? Saturday. Saturday. Irrespective of gender, irrespective of country, irrespective of location, irrespective of climate, there is a cycle. So just be careful. If you've got a heart problem, stay closer to the hospital on Monday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's one that's come up recently because now we, people are starting to track people's health by what they search on Google. Back in the day, you never search on Google, right? You just ask your doctor what is the health problem. Now you can go and use Dr. Google. Dr. Google says that most health information searches on Monday, most initiation of quitting behaviors by addicted tobacco smokers is also on Monday, maybe because they smoked on the weekend, felt guilty on a Monday when they went back to work, they started searching. But there were fewest health searches on Saturday consistently across languages, English, Chinese, Portuguese, French, German. They did this whole entire study looking at Google health searches. Interesting, right? ABC Science Show, not too long ago, a few years ago, showed that a survey that tumors disappear completely in just 7% of patients when treated with chemotherapy, the question they asked is, did the time of administering chemotherapy have an effect? The periodicity is roughly how long? Seven days. So doctors and scientists are starting to realize, hey, hang on, it's not the question of whether it's 3 or 5 or 7 or 12. The answer is, it's always 7. Now, what are we going to do to optimize what we do to actually help sick patients get better? Because we know that their body functions on a 7-day cycle. So if I'm going to follow their body's pattern, I'm going to time the, the, the duration or perhaps the commencement or the regularity of which I administer medicines to be able to help them get better. Interesting, right? Let me show you three particular studies which I found fascinating. Weekend migraine. How many of you have had a headache before? Yeah, many of us have had a headache. For those of you who suffer from migraine, it's not a pleasant experience, okay? Migraine uh, can be significant, can require hospitalization in some situations. Look here, it is a general belief that migraine attacks are prone to occur on days off. The objective of this study was to investigate periodicity of migraine with respect to weekly circumceptin variations. Let's look here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Peak of migraine here, you can see. This is a daily cycle, daily cycle. When you go through, you read the entire article, you see that there's a daily cycle, uh, sorry, a weekly cycle of uh, this migraine pattern happening. Here's a more interesting one. Your circadian changes in mood. Here, let me explain this nice diagram. For those of you who are in the science field or who read journals regularly, you probably already understand what it means. But here, A is referring to Australia, USA, and T is the total effect. They use Monday as the control. So Monday is considered number one, right? Day one. And they have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This middle dot represents the median uh, result or the relationship. So in, if this dot for T is above the line, it means that Tuesday is worse than Monday. Does that make sense? So here, we, let's try it out. So we have Tuesday higher than Monday. Monday is one, reference. Wednesday, higher. Thursday, higher. Friday, higher. Saturday, lower. Sunday, higher. On a weekly basis, this is the process, this is the circumceptin circadian changes in what? Mood. Okay, so people tend to have 
better mood on Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, then Thursday, then Friday, and Sunday, but Saturday is the exception. Saturday has people's mood is better than Monday. Does that make sense? So when is people's mood the best? And when is people's mood the, mo the worst? Probably Sunday. Now some people say, oh, you know why? Because on Sunday, people are dreading going back to work. Right? And on Saturday, people have just finished work. So of course their mood is better. It's going to be better, right? Why is work wouldn't it better be better on Saturday and worse on Sunday? But you don't realize that this study, when you look at it, is actually on people who do shift work. When you do shift work, like I do shift work, the days lose track, you lose track of time. Sometimes I do seven to ten day shi uh, shifts, blocks. You lose track of what day is what day. And yet, there is this weekly, non-changing, uh, persistent cycle where the moods are better on uh, Saturday and worse on Sunday compared to the rest of the week. Oh, but you say, Daryl, I'm not convinced. All right. Let me show you the second part of this study. Let's look at it this way. Okay, so again, the little dot represents the, the mean, and this is the variation. And you can see this represents positive affect. Positive affect is the medical term for positive mood. Sunday, not so positive. Monday, better. Tuesday, better. Wednesday, better. Thursday, oh, not so good. Friday and Saturday, the best. Weekly cycle, yeah? Sad on Sunday, happy on Saturday. Hey, check this one out. Next slide. Opposite, negative effect. When people's uh, rate of poor mood is the lowest. Sunday, oh, really bad on Monday when they go back to work. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The lower, the better. So here we again see, we start to see there's a pattern. And not only is there not a decision or discussion about a 3 versus a 5 versus a 12 day, it's always 7. And it seems that every one of the studies, as you dig deeper and deeper and deeper, there is a relationship between this day and the 7-day cycle. I'm not making it up. I'm just showing you studies after study after study. Here's another one. Release of urinary cortisol and catecholamine. So cortisol is a steroid in the body that is produced when you are stressed. We're talking about stress today, right? The higher your stress levels, the higher your cortisol levels. In fact, they say that when you are persistently stressed, your body cortisol is always high and it has significant impacts. It lowers your immune system. Now, you know why people fall sick all the time when they're stressed. It makes you more prone to things like diabetes. Here we go. Let me show you this. In other words... The serum cortisol should be high on this graph when you are stressed. So the higher the number, like up here, the more stressed you are, yeah? Let's look at the cycles. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sorry, so it starts here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And you look throughout the cycle as you go through, there is a seven-day repeated. Now, this is on people, if you look in here, looking at a survey for 40 days and looking at various people released, talking about stress hormones. When you look at the, cycle, uh, the study, and you, I don't have time to cover it in detail today, when you go back and read it, you will find that on a regular basis, on a persistent, non-changing, over 40 days, the cortisol levels are always lower on Saturday. In other words... Your stress is always lower than set on Saturday. So we come back to the original question that I ask. Is it a historical cultural factor? The Jews, Christians, believe in the seven-day cycle that was described in Genesis, which is not necessarily proven in science, although we've just seen that it is proven in science. Is it just an environmental factor? You know, everyone around you keeps a seven-day week, so you just keep a seven-day week because your boss says you work five days and have two days off. Or is it something that was inbuilt and endogenous? And so this is the question that they're wrestling with. Remember I showed you Rein Reinberg's article right at the start? This is their conclusion. We hypothesize that the seven-day time structure of human beings is endogenous in origin a hypothesis that is affirmed by a wide array of evidence and synchronized by social cultural factors linked to the Saturday or Sunday holy day of rest. Not all Christians keep Sunday, obviously. We also hypothesize that they are representative, at least in part, 
of the biological requirement for rest and repair one day each seven days, just as the circadian time structure is representative in part of the biological need for rest and repair each 24 hours. Do you know how significant this statement is? This statement is basically telling you that scientists are saying that the seven-day cycle is not because someone decided it was seven and I passed it on to the next generation and the next country and the next country, that seven-day cycles are inbuilt into your body and are programmed there whether you like it or not. And on top of that, for whatever reason, in this seven-day cycle, according to them, you need one day of rest on top of the six days of work. Not two, not three and a half, not five, but one day of rest. Fascinating, right? Doesn't this just mirror what this says? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that six days should thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And this goes exactly to Mark chapter 2, verse 27 in the Bible, which says, He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Scientists have only touched the tip of the iceberg of what we already know. If you don't want to be stressed, it's a very simple thing. If you don't want to be stressed, you need to understand that your body functions on a seven-day cycle. Don't try and make it a 10 or a 5. I should tell my bosses at work not to roster me on for 10-day stretches, right? Because your body works on a seven-day cycle and needs one day of rest, and this is programmed in your body. And you're starting to find that as they dig deeper, the studies show that the best day, the most efficient day, in fact, the day that your body was designed to rest was Saturday. Not Sunday, not Tuesday, not Thursday, not Friday, because you get least amount of heart attacks, the most positive mood, the least amount of suicides on Saturday, because your body was programmed to work like that. Not because someone decided to tell you, not because someone decided to hand down some tradition, but because God created your body to function in a seven-day cycle with one day of rest on the seventh day. This is the best and most effective stress relief plan there ever was. Fascinating, right? This is me with a very stressed patient. I'm not stressed. The patient is stressed when they were trying to take this photo. The poor guy almost cried, I remember. So this is in my hospital. I'm going to tell you a story to illustrate my point here. When I was studying and training to do pediatrics, I actually have to do my ex big exams. And two years ago, I did these big exams, and it requires about 18 months of preparation. And in this 18 months of preparation, you do this preparation on a regular basis. And on a regular basis, here's what I mean. You work from 8 to 5 o'clock or 8 to 5.30, and then we break for dinner at about 5.30 to 6. And then at 6 o'clock, we go and see patients from 6 to 8. We give them a half an hour break, and then we see them from 8.30 to 9.30 before they go to bed as we practice every day. So this would be five days a week or four at least, and then sometimes on the weekend, you go back and do the same thing over and over again. I saw more of my study group friends that I was practicing for this exam with than I did my family, and I spent more time in the hospital than I spent sleeping in my own bed. This was my life for about 12 to 18 months. And you can imagine that this was an extremely rigorous and tiring process. You know, you don't know when the next time you can rest is. You, do, you, you keep having to drag yourself to work and to keep seeing patient after patient to practice for this exam. And I remember... There was, uh, at the start of the preparation, there was a notice that was put up, and the notice went something like this. We're going to have regular sessions on Saturday morning to practice for the exam. And so my consultants, the senior doctors in the hospital, would turn up on Saturday morning out of their own free will as a bonus volunteer process to help us prepare. All 60 of us prepared for this exam. They coach us for four hours, practicing on patient after patient after patient. And they would do this for week and weeks and weeks. In fact, I think four to five months of preparation. I made up my mind early because I believed that our body functions on a seven-day cycle, that I was going to rest on the seventh day. 
And so I told my professors and I told my consultants before we started preparing for the exam that I would not be able to attend. And I asked them, can you switch it around and move it out because I need to rest on this particular day and move it to Sunday morning? And they said, no, I'm sorry, we can't move it. They tried, they investigated, but it's okay. We'll help you to prepare. So I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to come. I can't. And so I would stop my preparation on the seventh day, starting on Friday night at sunset, and all the way to Saturday sunset, I didn't do any preparation for my exam. And so my classmates, my colleagues would start to ask me, hey, Daryl, are you going to rock up at the practice exam tomorrow? And my answer would always be the same. No, I'm resting. I'm going to uh, do my other activities on this day. I'm going to go to church and spend some time resting away from my studies. And before long, they began to answer their own question. Hey, Daryl, are you coming? No, 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 you're not coming. You're, you're resting. You're doing your resting. You're not coming. And before long, it became known to the entire group that was preparing for this exam that Daryl would not turn up to the practice, even if it meant he didn't get the same amount of benefit and practice, and even if it meant he would fail the exam. You see, failing this exam is no easy thing. You can't just reset it tomorrow. You wait one entire year. You've got to wait until the next year before you can sit it again. And if you fail, you wait one more year and so on and so forth. And so this was a high-stakes exam. And so one day, I was sitting at the lunch table. We give ourselves 15 minutes for lunch. I don't know, you guys maybe have half an hour lunch break. We limit ourselves to 15 minutes, okay? Because we want to see as many patients as we can preparing for this exam. We were sitting down in the, the, the lunch room and I was eating my lunch and I was thinking to myself, man, the exam is only a few weeks away. I'm getting more and more stressed. You're stressed, right? Time related to time. And so my colleague sat down with me. We were having lunch and she tapped me on the shoulder. She said, Daryl, I want to ask you a question. Why are you not stressed about your exam? In my mind, I was like, this, you must be crazy. What do you mean by not stressed? I'm stressed, just that I didn't say it. You know, this, I don't go on, on Saturdays because I, I'm resting. I, I have so much stuff to do. You guys get all the extra preparation. And here you are asking me, why are you not stressed? And all I could say to her, I was trying to be nice. and I was trying to hold my, my, my frustration in. I said, I'm actually stressed, but I'm just not showing it. And she said, no, 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 that's not true. You are not like the others. You don't seem stressed about this exam, even if it means that you will fail because you don't turn up to the, the practice thing. And so I said, hey, let me tell you why I'm not so stressed. I didn't say not stressed. I said not so stressed. Because I believe in a seven-day cycle and I'm resting on the day that God created my body to rest. And so we began to talk and to share, and before long, the lunch break was over. And I said, hey, you know, if you're interested, after the exams, I'll tell you more about why I don't seem stressed to you. By God's grace, a few weeks later, I passed that exam, never have to do an exam again, so happy. And my friend, my colleague came up to me and said, hey, you remember you told me before the exam about your whatever resting thing, you know, like, tell me more about it now. It's after the exams, you promised me, right? And so I began to tell my colleague about the concept we call the Sabbath. We started Bible studies, my sister and one of the other church members started Bible studies with her. And today she's a member of my church. You never know what happens to your body when you try this cycle out. If your body was programmed to function on a seven-day cycle, would it not make sense for you to actually program your body, your routine, your schedule to function as your body was designed? And not only that, on a seven-day cycle, but to rest on the day your body was designed to rest. If doctors are trying to decide which day is the best day to give chemo because of this cycle, maybe we can take the simple, stress-free step of following a pattern that our body was designed to do. In other words, work for six days, rest on the seventh. There is no other explanation for the fact simply that science has proven a seven-day circa septum cycle is endogenous in your body. Your body was designed to function in this manner. 
And so if you want a stress-free life, make your routine function in the way your body was designed to function. Make sense? I'm going to close the word of prayer now, but I'm happy if there's enough time for you guys to ask some questions and I can answer them. So let's just say a word of prayer to finish first. Father, thank you for giving us this information about the seven-day cycles. We pray that as we process this information, it will make more sense to us, but that we will also give it a try in order to make our lives more stress-free and less stressful. We ask in Jesus' name.